I welcome Professor Jawaharlal Call here for uh, this presentation relating to teaching of international law. Professor Jawaharlal Call comes with uh, almost uh, four decades of rich experience teaching international law and other courses in uh, Delhi University. He is a former vice chancellor, and we look forward to his views as to how. international law should be taught uh, i would uh, start this conversation with my first question that what difficulty is usually faced in teaching of international law uh thank you general nilender sahab firstly i thank you for bringing me on board in this extremely important project which you have undertaken i appreciate the efforts undertaken by you though i would add that there are many other forums which have been discussing about the difficulties are being faced by those teachers who either taught international law or who would be teaching international law in future i recall the most important conclave that is called as singapore conclave which happened perhaps in 2018 or 2019 and the major thrust of that enclave was inquiring about international law teachers the difficulties which they face while teaching international law now they have been pointed about three or four things and which deserve to be repeated at your forum also one is that if you go back into history of teaching international law in india at least international law was taken not so very seriously as a subject as a discipline or even from a career point of view to that extent therefore the students they did not really uh, look up to international law from purpose of a career point of view to that extent what they did was while studying international law it was only for obtaining grades either at graduate level or at post graduate levels simultaneously there were not many kind of openings in terms of uh, scholarships fellowships so on and so forth or even internships for international law at that point of time at least when i started my uh, law school days primarily i would say when we look when i go back or when i look back i would say there were two important uh, difficulties which were faced both by the students and by the teachers uh, one was the lack of resources academic resources and other resources lack of original statutes if at all there they were there and if you recall delhi university was the first law faculty in delhi university was the first to start uh, case material system and even that case material system uh, was not fully sort of i would say competent or i would say complete in all respects because both teachers and students they took that case case material as exhaustive rather than illustrative and to that extent therefore both teachers and students they just looked at that case material and uh, would study would learn and for purpose of obtaining grades second important difficulty which existed at that point of time was there wasn't any kind of available orientation programs at least in international uh, law, domain. law domain neither for the teachers nor for the students uh, that was practically one of the most uh, you know important debacles i would say 
for purposes of non-growth of international law from every perspective. That is second. But now perhaps if you recall at the latest developments and with the growth of huge number of law schools around the country, both five year and three year, there has been now uh, a newer thinking about how do we do about international law teaching? How do we do about providing resources both to the teachers and to the students? And the objective of this exercise should be and is, the objective I repeat of this exercise should be and is to see to it that the students they, when they come out, they come out as real professionals, which would mean that as not what they have uh, understood, but what they have learned, which would mean outcome-based approach is extremely important for purposes of growth of international law teaching and for purposes of career prospects for future students. Because unless and until that outcome-based approach is ingrained in our system of teaching, in our curriculum, in our syllabus. A student will never ever be a complete professional. Now, I add, uh, I, I, I dare to add, this is absolutely because of the fact that now, post-90, because of globalization, so on and so forth, and now you come across people saying that we have we are now living in a global village. Absolutely, that is true. There are, there are, there are three important things which has happened post-1990. One is there has been an uh, uh, incredible growth in international law, uh, both statutory international law in terms of uh, treaties, conventions, so on and so forth, and in terms of other understandings, agreements, so on and so forth. Now, the obvious consequence of this is that not only has the scope and breadth of international law grown incredibly, but respect for international law has also grown incredibly. Obviously, there could be debates about yeah. here and there, but that really does not take away the fact that respect for international law has increased. The third is that whether it is complete or incomplete, there has been a trend towards accountability of both states and individuals. Okay. Uh, you, you, ha you have been a part of that process, I mean, international criminal law or international criminal uh, uh, tribunal you have now, and they have passed judgments also, and they have awarded, uh, awarded the sentences to those who, are, who have been guilty of war crimes. Right violations of laws of war yeah. or war crimes. So to that extent, therefore, accountability of both states and uh, individuals have also grown. Now here one might ask me a question that uh, what type of accountability have you in mind? Accountability is not only in terms of, you know, punishing a state per se, but accountability could be in terms of segregation of a state from an international, let's suppose, international uh, tribunal or international forum. What happened in Russia latest, lately? Russia has been ousted from Human Rights Council. Now, that is also some sort of accountability. Yes. Yes. So, which would mean that, as I, I repeat, that respect for international law has grown. States are showing due respect to international law. Now, accountability of individuals has uh, ha has been has been proved in this. and lastly uh, there is a newer breed of uh, international subjects a newer breed of international uh, you know uh, international lawyers uh, you you would agree to with now you have international investment lawyers you have international arbitrate arbitration lawyers and such centers of excellence have grown and if such centers of excellence in international uh, law uh, have grown, so you would definitely need a better equipped, qualified, 
professionally competent and outcome based lawyer international lawyer now you have uh, brought about the consequences which have emerged from this increase in the breadth and scope other than this have there been some challenges also of course you have already spoken absolutely about absolutely see yeah. i would say teaching by itself is a challenging job yes why i am saying is a challenging job is because of the fact that uh you got to think about the future of hundreds of teacher hundreds of students which you are teaching at points of times you have to be a part of them now being a part of them it gives you an incredible you know kind of opportunity not only to know further from your perspective but also to sort of get into with them so that they come to your level of understanding they come to your level of thought they come to your level of uh, what i say analysis now with that in background what would you say with regard to the relevance and application of international law now <coughs> jan sab uh, if you look at objectively today from today's perspective and if you compare it let's say 30 years down the line back at that point of time international law was confined only to foreign officers international law was not con- was was only confined to foreign officers it it wasn't uh, kind of uh, prevalent in general academic matrix either domestically or internationally but as i said with the growth and increase in international law disciplines right so it became necessary for countries it became necessary for students and teachers to think about application of that international law in almost every day existence now to add to it as i said earlier not only has states uh, shown respect to international law even courts at domestic levels they have shown deference to international law one two they have relied on international agreements they have relied on international conventions in terms of giving a uh, breadth to individual liberties and freedoms our own honorable supreme court has relied on many international law conventions human rights conventions to increase the scope and breadth of individual liberties human rights and freedoms at domestic level now which would illustrate how applicability of international law has you know increased how applicability of international law has become relevant and if you look at constitutional provisions in india you have separate constitutional provisions in indian constitution for purposes of application of international law for purposes of uh, how international law can quote and unquote automatically be incorporated at domestic levels read it into and to by way of incorporation yes. see india has uh if i am not mistaken subject to correction india has been forefront in uh automatically incorporating customary international law we have always held this position that customary international law has been always a part and parcel of indian uh, uh you know legal legalization unlike the treaties unlike the treaties now treaties if you want them to be applicable at domestic levels they have to be ratified and incorporated through a separate legislation but there also as you as you talked about applicability of international law there also a difference has been made that there are certain treaties there are certain treaties which are op- which are uh, based on or which do contain customary international law so even if you have not even if a state has not ratified that state but because it contains 
what we call as customary international law. There's a another another. I am not getting into a definition of what customary international law is. I think uh, students, those who yes. they, they they know about that. So those treaties which have which either are based on customary international law or contain customary international law, that customary law, customary international law, courts have said it could be applicable per se, without. Assumes a binding nature. But yes, so absolutely. Not merely persuasive. Absolutely. So that's, that's how, I think this is an important question, which have, that's how uh, application of international law has today increased. Look at what is happening in international arbitration. Right, you have many conventions which talk about arbitration and how an international award, arbitration award is binding on the parties, irrespective of where it has been. There are obviously grounds for telling, I'll not get into it, but this would mean that how international law has become applicable at, dif at, at different levels of, uh, you know, I mean, contact between individuals, businessmen, states, so on and so forth. I mean, uh, recently when we talk about war, see, look at how uh, for the last, let's say, 30 years down the line, how uh, you are part of that uh, criminal, international criminal law, how that has become uh, been, been applicable in conflicts, both armed conflicts, or, I mean, uh, both international armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. Again, at that point of time, or again at that point of uh, you know understanding, we do uh, accept that that is how international law has now become applicable between states, so on and so forth, organizations, so on. Paul Saab, you had mentioned for these uh, new challenges that have come, and uh, the job openings are there, new careers are available. Because of this, what uh, pressure or expectations are there now from teachers of international law? You have an extraordinary pressure on teachers nowadays because of two reasons. Uh, one is that there's a competition amongst teachers themselves also for being branded as number one international law teacher for, for being, you know, uh, branded as excellent teacher. So you have competition amongst teachers themselves. Now, that drives home a point that that competition leads them to newer openings also. And that is the reason that, that today's international law teacher has to be professionally equipped, has to be professionally competent, and performing as well and challenge for them is from the from the students point of view also you see today when a student comes to law school he does not come empty headed he comes along with a lot of knowledge Though he may not have come with a lot of wisdom, there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. But yes, certainly, right, right. because of the fact that today you have internet access to all, you have smartphones whereby on the fingertip you can find out. Yes. And if a teacher goes wrong in saying something, a student will get up yes. and he will immediately tell her, excuse me sir, you are wrong, this is what is the exact position. To that extent, therefore, today's teacher has to compete with the students also. Has to be on toes. <laughs> has to be on toes because he does not know how much qualified or how much knowledgeable, how much resourceful is the student. He does not know. See, when we started, uh, you know, studying law, we did not have this kind of, you know, kind of uh, available resources. We did not have that. But today's student, when he comes to a law school, he comes to law school with a background okay. in certain fields, in certain uh, respects. And to that extent, therefore, a teacher is not only 
having a competition amongst themselves, but a teacher is having a competition with the students also. Because that student will eventually have, uh, have, have uh, a, a say, because there are law schools which ask for sort of uh, feedback. feedback. So that student is an important stakeholder today in the modern education system. See, and today as I said, uh, availability of resources, though there are certain resources which are protected and there are certain resources which are open uh, resources and anybody can access that open resource without any cost to his pocket. Though I would uh, here say humbly uh, say that uh, you may not be in a position to get excellent research uh, papers which are mostly copyrighted uh, and uh, if you want to access that research article or good essay on uh, international, any subject of international law, you will have to pay you know, maybe $30, $25, which perhaps today's some teachers can afford, but students cannot afford them. So therefore, students have to rely exclusively on the open access resources. Uh, that might be a difficulty, that might be a difficulty, but then there are possibilities of overcoming those difficulties. There are possibilities of overcoming those difficulties. Uh, now, today you, you have mm, uh, so many channels, for example, today uh, in the present scenario, Ukraine conflict is, uh, is analyzed point by point, paragraph wise, uh, dissected. dissected and professionally. It's not that, uh, uh, you know, mundane approach towards, they are discussed you know, in a very proficient, proficient way. But uh, just a brief point I would want uh, your uh, take. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the availability of uh, uh, knowledge now, if I use the word knowledge. Uh, do you think that language uh, creates a problem there, say Hindi or other languages? See, I tell you what, when we started our law school days, so it was all uh, English medium. Uh, though by the grace of God, I have never been uh, a product of an English medium school. I studied at government schools. So because of our family background, we did not have any such kind of problems in conversation, conversing in English. And uh, at that point of time, uh, there was this kind of issue because of the fact that resources in international law were available only in English or majorly in English, significantly in uh, English. So in any other vernacular, it was not applicable. For that purpose, you know, there were uh, you know, there were there were schemes for translating translations, yes. but uh, I, I would say uh, overwhelming majority of the students who opted for law at that point of time, they did not have this kind of language issue, at least in understanding yes. English. Let me give you a, uh, a personal anecdote. I started my uh, career from Rotter, okay. which is essentially yes. you know Hindi belt. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Hindi belt, which is Haryanvi belt. Yes. So, I was given Indian legal history. You know, that is another problem with the law schools, that if you have majored, if you have majored in, let's say, international law, you are told to teach inter, in, uh, legal history or you are told to teach constitutional law, which you may not have any reckoning with. Anyway, so I was given uh, Indian legal history. Now, Indian legal history, uh, mostly available in English uh, books. One or two books were available in Hindi, but I really did not know Hindi because Urdu and English and Persian uh, uh, was our uh, medium. So I was teaching it and uh, I don't know uh, whether my language was supersonic or whatever, they could not understand that English, though I uh, used very simple uh, English. So they went to the vice chancellor. They said Ki, he, he is not teaching us. So he called me. He said, "What is your problem?" I said, "I don't have any problem. 
I am teaching Indian legal history in English because the statute says that medium of instruction and examination is English. Okay. So, to that extent, therefore, I am teaching in simple English. Uh, maybe they are not English medium schools or they do not know, uh, understand English, that is not my problem, Mr. Vice Chancellor, because you yourself can check out that medium of instruction and examination is English. Okay, well, yeah, that's right. Uh, then I had a little bit of courage to ask him, sir, can you ask them? In which language are they asking me a question? If at all they ask a question, tell them in which language are you asking a question or ask them. They were, we were, we were across the table. So he was a hard vice chancellor, very knowledgeable and uh, so he asked them. कि तुम किस लैंग्वेज में सवाल पूछते हो नवर साहब हिंदी मैंने कहा साहब गलत बोल रहे हैं व्हाट डू मीन गलत बोल रहे हैं मैंने कहा साहब ये हिंदी में नहीं बोलते हैं ये हिंदी भी जाटू भाषा में बोलते हैं नाउ टेल मी फॉर गॉड्स सेक व्हाट कैन आई डू आई डोंट नो रिटन हिंदी आई कैन ऑब्वियसली कन्वर्ट्स इन हिंदी नो प्रॉब्लम नो प्रॉब्लम but that is only when they ask me a question in Hindi. They are asking me a question in Jatu Basha. What do I do? So that is one That'll of the most practical. See, it's problems. the practical problems which you come across. But uh, nowadays, I am told that uh, you know uh, some law schools or they have tried to translate uh, uh, different uh, you know yes. 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 Reading, yes. Materials. Yes. reading materials in 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 either Hindi or in their vernacular language. So that is perhaps best thing. But, but, but uh, uh, I mean, at international levels, uh, let me be honest that you will have to have a meaningful English language, both, both for purposes of conversation, for purposes of writing, for purposes of analysis, and, and for purposes of interaction. You would need that. Okay. This brings us to end of part one. Thank you.